Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody. If you're here in the United States, um, uh, good afternoon for those of you in the UK or on another European time zone. Um, welcome to this uh, executive roundtable from British American Business, um, where we're going to be talking about global trade and geopolitics. And we're thrilled to be bringing you this uh, discussion in partnership with our good friends at AIG. And this discussion will form part of AIG's global trade series, which we'll hear more about in a moment. So the format today, um, I'm going to be moderating a discussion uh, with a panel of uh, trade experts. And if you'd like to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to do that. We're going to ask you to do that via the chat function. And I will do my best to weave into the discussion any comments that come through uh, through the chat. So um, the, the more discursive these events are, uh, the more the, the, the more value everybody gets. It's a pleasure now for me to introduce uh, our partner today. Um, Anthony Baldwin is the CEO of AIG in the UK and. I'm delighted to welcome him to make a few introductory remarks. So, Anthony. Thank you, uh, Duncan. And uh, really, it's a great pleasure to add my own welcome to this event. Um, I'm really grateful to Duncan and to the BAP team for suggesting a webinar on the global trade uh, to really coincide with the launch of the 2021 uh, Global Trade Series this month. In the three years since it was launched, the Global Trade Series has become an important convener of debates on global trade. It brings together policymakers, business leaders, and academics and emphasizes the importance of exchanging regional perspectives. AIG's motive for creating this series was to demonstrate our support for the rules-based international trading system. Going back decades, AIG has a proud record of supporting trade liberalization market opening and the WTO. In the current context, the global tension with global tension, economic nationalism and loss of faith in globalization, we feel that our engagement and collaboration with others in a constructive and forward looking trade debate is more important than ever. It matters to AIG as a company and to the clients we work with that the global trading system functions well and is made more sustainably and inclusive. It matters to us that the multilateral consensus on trade and the rules underpinning it continue to provide a predictable and supportive environment for trade and commerce. Behind every business transaction, there is an insurance policy that protects business and keeps the economic engine running. So the reason we created the Global Trade Series is to demonstrate our commitment to global trade and also the reason we are delighted to be partnering with BAB on this webinar. I want to thank again, uh, Bab and Duncan for inviting us to join uh, this series and this event and thank our outstanding speakers for sharing their views. Thank you very much. And I look forward to a active discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Anthony. And uh, thank you for your terrific support, support for uh, British American business. It's, uh, it's hugely appreciated. Uh, now, just to tell us a little bit more about uh, the uh, Global Trade Series and the podcasts that have uh, been launched, I'm going to pass to Rem Korteweg from the Klingendal Institute. Rem. Thank you very much, uh, Duncan. Um, it's an honor to speak a couple of words of welcome as, as coordinator or, uh, of, the, of the AIG Global Trade Series podcast conversations, because unfortunately, because of the COVID situation, we um, won't be able to organize any live events uh, like we did last year, but instead we're bringing together a group of eminent trade officials and trade experts to reflect on the primary dynamics, economic, political dynamics, shaping the global trade environment, and including among those uh, absolutely fantastic experts. Uh, you'll today hear from three of them, Marianne, Jeffrey, and, uh, and David. Now, this afternoon, the discussion focuses a little bit on the US-UK or the US-UK-EU trade relationship. But let me also share a couple of hints of what the focus of this year's AIG Global Trade Series is. 
we we will explore the current state of U.S.-China trade relations or trade tensions, if you will. We'll look at how globalization is changing and shifting towards more regional and plurilateral efforts. We'll focus on regional trade initiatives in the Americas, but also in the Indo-Pacific, and look at how the trade and climate agendas intersect and perhaps also reinforce one another, and how to respond to protectionist tendencies and in growing inequality. We'll cover these issues in around 10 podcasts, which you will be able to find on the AIG Global Trade Series website. Now, let me just finish with two points that are more pertinent to today's discussion, to the US, EU, UK trade triangle. Firstly, despite ongoing difficulties in the implementation of the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement, there is a common UK-EU trade agenda that we need to nourish and build upon. It revolves around WTO reform, updating global trade rules, also relates very strongly to common agendas on climate and trade, and sort of bringing trade rules up to par with 21st century concerns and interests and coordinating, of course, the post-COVID recovery, looking at strategic stockpiles, reducing dependencies in critical supply chains and avoiding protectionism. And this, I think, should underpin some of the discussion that right now has been crowded out by a focus on the post-Brexit environment. The second point I'd add is that the US and the EU are absolutely indispensable partners to move rules-based international trade forward. But bilateral trade disagreements can get in the way. Resolving issues around digital services taxation, the Carver border adjustment mechanism, and even Boeing Airbus, resolving those issues will be crucial to unlocking a broader push for strengthening international rules-based trade. Now, I really look forward to today's discussion, and we hope with the AIG Global Trade Series that in a very small way, our podcast conversations can help generate a better understanding and a more conducive environment to moving forward with this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rem. And uh, we're all looking forward to this uh, series. And uh, I'm pleased to say that this uh, discussion is being recorded and will also be made available on the AIG Trade Series website and on the British American Business site and our usual uh, social channels. Um, so um, inevitably, it, this is a huge subject, and uh, to try to cover all of the all of the points um, that we'd like to in an hour is going to be tough. But I'm pleased to say that with me today to have this discussion, we have got a chance of doing that with the most distinguished panel that you could assemble. And let me just briefly introduce our panelists. Hopefully now just joined, we have uh, Kelly Ann Shaw, who's a partner for international trade and investment at Hogan Lovells and a former US government advisor on trade and economic security issues. I know Kelly Ann had some connection problems, but welcome Kelly Ann, nice to see you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Jeff Schott, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute, uh, a leading US authority on trade issues. We have uh, Marianne Schneider-Petzinger, Senior Research Fellow for the US and Americas program at Chatham House. Uh, Marianne focuses on trade and transatlantic cooperation. And finally, we have uh, David Hennig, Director for UK Trade Policy Project at the European Center for International Political Economy and a, for, a formerly a UK uh, trade official in the UK government. So welcome everybody. And we are going to jump straight into uh, the discussion. And if I may, I'm gonna start uh, Kellyanne with you. I know you've just arrived, but uh, hopefully uh, that's okay. Um, and just ask you for a kind of your perspective on the uh, new administration in the United States and its approach uh, to trade uh, and to trade policy. It seems, you know, from our perspective that, you know, there's the, the, the priority in the US is the domestic agenda. There's not a lot being said 
um, at the most senior levels about trade policy. Um, and what has been said doesn't, you know, how different is what has been said from perhaps what went before? Um, uh, are people who are expecting a major shift in US trade policy going to be disappointed? Just, just give us a sense of, 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 of what you're seeing in the US on trade issues. Sure, no problem. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Apologies for the delay this morning. My computer decided to reboot right before our panel. So I'm glad that we were able to, to make it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's been interesting. So I, I served in the previous administration um, as well as in the Obama administration. So I've seen sort of this arc of progression in US trade policy. Um, and, and what we're seeing out of the Biden administration is, is effectively radio silence. At least it seems so for those who are used to trade gracing the, the front uh, page of the newspaper every single day. Um, but what I would offer is that unlike other areas of domestic policy and other areas of foreign policy, there is not this strong break between the parties. There is instead a large uh, bipartisan view that the United States needs to continue to take care of its workers, to level the playing field overseas, um, to continue to trade with countries, but to do so in a more methodical way, and then to be very aggressive towards the competition coming from China. So those themes certainly persist in the Biden administration's trade policy. But why don't we hear a lot about it? We hear things like a worker-centric trade policy, whatever that means. And, and we hear about initiatives like Buy America or uh, the rise of industrial policies. And part of that is just the moment of time that we're in. We're dealing with a global pandemic. We're dealing Dealing with an economic recovery. There are other things like infrastructure, uh, tax reform that are, are taking more precedence in terms of the headlines. Um, but mostly, I think they're trying to figure it out as they go. I would take a lot, a lot of the silence that we've heard on trade policy throughout the campaign trail as tacit acknowledgement that the direction that trade had been going for the last four years wasn't bad, and that is likely the direction moving forward. But with the focus on industrial policies, with the focus on a domestic agenda, it's going to have implications for our trading partners in that we're just going to be less interested in having those conversations right now. But I do think much like the Obama administration who started off not really caring about trade at all and then grew to care about it very deeply, we'll probably see a bit of that in the years to come. But I wouldn't expect trade to make the headlines anytime soon. Okay, that's a, that's a terrifically good uh, kind of opening briefing. And I think I think you know, anybody who read the former USTR's uh, written work or speeches talking about this kind of third way approach to trade, you know, in, interested in open uh, trade, but still protecting the interests of American workers, you know, could see a very natural line into the, the new administration. So, Marianne, I want to come to you and, 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 and just get your perspective on what that might mean for the UK and the EU when they're keen to engage with the US on, on trade issues. Um, I, I, do, you, do, you, do you get a sense of frustration from the, the UK and uh, EU trade negotiators about uh, the, the US position? I mean, the, the new USTR, Catherine Tai, Ambassador Tai has said she's gonna spend time kind of reviewing all of the US um, uh, positions, policy positions on trade issues. That means people are having to kind of wait in, in Europe and the UK before they can engage with her. So what, what's your sense of, of what this means for the, the, the European side? Well, I think expectations have certainly been lowered. And the big question is, you know, is there going to be a trade deal? And I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think it's actually quite unlikely that the US and the UK can strike a trade deal before 2023. And that's in part because the US is so focused on domestic priorities and again, a worker-centered trade policy. But it's also in part because trade promotion authority is set to expire on the 1st of July. And again, it's unlikely that that is going to be renewed because of midterm elections coming up in 2022. So again, I think it's quite unlikely that any quite sensitive trade legislation will be passed before then. The question then becomes, you know, how much can the US and the UK salvage from the negotiations that have been conducted thus far? And again, also keep in mind that many of the sensitive issues haven't been negotiated yet. And again, access for US agricultural products will still be contentious in two years time. And a lot of work still has to go into that. 
But in the meantime, I do think that the US and UK can make meaningful progress on a number of other areas. And I think the call between this trust and Catherine Tai has very much outlined where that space exists. It's on the one hand on removing bilateral trade tensions. And I think here front and center will be finding a permanent solution to the tariff dispute over Airbus and Boeing, ideally by July, because that's when the temporary freeze on retaliatory tariff expires. A second issue is very much related to the US tariffs that are threatened in response to the UK's digital services tax. There could be room to move those discussions forward at a multilateral level within the OECD. So again, hopefully that will be resolved. And last but, but not least, um, the US Section 232 steel and aluminum tariffs that again, Trump introduced in the name of national security are still in place. And again, I think that's an area that could be tackled fairly easily. Now, besides those bilateral issues, there is still a lot of common ground between the US and the UK at the global level. And here again, it's reforming the WTO, it's what role trade can play in combating climate change. And again, it's also shared concerns around non-market economy practices by China and tackling market distorting industrial subsidies. So I think the agenda is still quite big and progress can be made. Perfect. Well, that's a, that's a, a brilliant introduction to the kind of UK and EU position. Um, I'm going to just stay focused on the UK, if I may. And David, come to you. Um, the UK government has, you know, both during the Brexit process and since, talked about kind of global Britain and the opportunities that Britain has as a free and open um, uh, trading nation. Uh, from everything I read, um, the Secretary of State for International Trade, Liz Truss, seems to be extremely popular, at least within her party, as she uh, signs um, uh, trade agreements or rolls over uh, old trade agreements that existed with the, with the EU. Can you just give a sense of you know, how real this, this global Britain uh, agenda is when it comes to trade? and um you know what that what that might actually mean in practice yes thank you uh, thank you duncan and i think you can be forgiven that this is one of these classic glass half full or glass half empty kind of moments because in one sense global britain it's a ridiculous statement the uk is a trading power we have been a trading power for a long time and in comparison to a lot of other countries and i would say for example the uh, the us we clearly do believe in, in trade a lot more. It's a lot more important to our story. So I think on that, in that sense, you know, we are going to be a supporter of trade. On the other hand, this is the government that's also just put up a lot of trade barriers with the EU and is suffering from a uh, reduction in trade as a result. The new trade agreements that are being negotiated with Australia and New Zealand look pretty thin, pretty standard. Most likely they're focusing on tariffs. There's very little being talked about about services or regulatory issues or other things that we would consider 21st century issues. Even joining the CPTPP, which I think is welcome to um, link the UK with um, like-minded countries, the likes of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Even that's actually a pretty, pretty thin agreement as well. So you, know, you can get the sense as well as a government that appears to prioritize signing deals over what worrying about what's in them that uh, is concerned more about tariffs and say movement of people um, which after all is the uk is the uk strength hasn't really got to grips at all with uh, the new issues coming down the track of climate change and yet well we're still novices in this game you know we're, we're still got our relationship with our own neighborhood to sort out and ultimately like I say, actually, whether it was Liz Truss or to be honest, it would be the same, I think, if it was the Labour Party. I think that any UK administration is going to support trade. So, you know, in one sense, add us into the, uh, you know, the, the positive column. But again, Brexit was part of the kind of backlash against trade as well. So half full, half empty, you choose. And, and just, just as a follow up on that, um, you know, we've heard from BAB has heard and, and talked to Liz Truss about the um, US 
UK FTA negotiations. I mean, she seems to sort of have recalibrated her timetable about, but, but hasn't really re recalibrated her expectations. She's still saying that she's very confident that an agreement can be reached, um, you know, but she, she pushed back the timetable into kind of 2022, not 2023, as Marianne says. But do you think that's realistic? I mean, what's your what your take on on the UK uh, DIT's expectations there? I, I think that uh, the UK government leans towards an optimism bias and has in the past, and that's been a bit disappointed in the in the past. There are tricky issues that we haven't really faced yet in the UK about domestic interest. We haven't really faced the the uh, the problems of agriculture that, let's face it, the EU and the US have. Government is hoping that they can get over those without too much bother. The global um, um, previous examples suggest that perhaps it will be harder than they than they realise. So I think certainly, I mean, certainly I'd agree with Marion. It's certainly 2023 at the earliest. But again, the UK government really wants the US trade deal. It really wants to say, you know, we're in for this for, for, for uh, free trade. Forget the bit about the EU, but the rest of it, we're in for free trade. So they really want it, but they may find it more tricky. So again, it's always that with the current UK government, it's like, yes, they really want something, but can they, do they quite have the full grasp of it? Not quite sure yet. And will it be everything that it could be? Will it be everything that a UK-US trade deal should be in, say, for example, digital or, or services? Mm, maybe not. Well, and, the, and, the, and the, the issues that we all know about are going to get in the way when the focus should be on the future, on the digital issues and all those things. That, that agriculture will definitely get in the way. Um, Jeff, I'm going to come to you, if I may. And just, just if, if we can, just take a step back from the details of kind of uh, bilateral negotiations and talk about the sort of global system. Uh, so we have a new director general at the WTO. We have a administration in the White House that seems to be a bit kind of friendlier towards um, multinational institutions or a little bit more willing to engage, whether the policies change or not, we'll hear from you, I guess. So what are, what are the prospects for um, kind of removing some of the dysfunction, I would say, I'd, let me put it like that, around um, uh, the WTO? Um, are, are you optimistic that reform is possible? Well, thank you, Duncan, for, for inviting me. Uh, the WTO is still in crisis, uh, but it has the tools to try to uh, dig out a very deep hole uh, uh, that it's been in for several years now. Uh, the new director general, uh, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, uh, is extraordinarily qualified. Uh, knowledgeable on trade, finance, and development issues. And the real challenges we face in the global trading system involve the intersection of those three uh, areas. Uh, one has to deal with, with trade, finance, uh, development, all together. And the trading system cannot uh, just be in its own silo. Uh, she has appointed a, a really top-notch team just last week, so they're getting started. Uh, but interestingly, one of the four deputy director generals uh, is uh, from the United States, is a Republican uh, from Congress, a very experienced uh, woman who has uh, led uh, the staff of the Ways and Means Committee in the House uh, for many years, Angela Ellard. And it's, I think, critical that uh, Ngozi has a clear signal from uh, 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 from her team on how to understand the, uh, the politics in the Congress on trade. And that's, as, as Kellyanne knows, is not an easy uh, topic to, to deal with. The immediate challenge then uh, is to deal with uh, how to confront vaccine nationalism. Uh, if uh, Ngozi fails on that, she will have squandered all the political capital that was given her at the start of her of her regime, and uh, so it's critical that the progress be made, uh, that the export controls be removed, uh, that the intellectual property uh, issues be resolved. And there, uh, Catherine Tai 
gave her uh, an olive branch, I think, last week to try to find some compromise on dealing with uh, the very difficult uh, issues of pharmaceutical patents. Uh, and hopefully that can be done in a way uh, that can show that the WTO can contribute uh, to international solutions of great importance. Uh, once she has that, then, there, then she needs some quick wins uh, on specific topics like fish subsidies and the environmental goods agreement that had been teed up in December uh, 2016, but was knocked off by Chinese uh, uh, recalcitrance. Uh, and uh, that would help restore confidence in using multilateral negotiations. But uh, even those seemingly simple areas are going to be hard, harder than uh, most people think, uh, because it requires cooperation among the major trading nations. Uh, and that means the United States working with China on trade, even as we continue to fight China uh, and, and aggressively counter Chinese practices in, in some areas. Uh, it also means dealing with India and other developing countries. So the task is difficult. Uh, it's doable uh, because the, 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 the risk of failure brings a result that I think will be harmful to all countries. That's, I think, the, 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 uh, the ace, uh, ace in the hole that uh, Ngozi has in pushing forward these negotiations. Yeah, I want to come back to the TRIPS, the TRIPS waiver and the, the, the intellectual property issue in, in a moment. But can I just stay just with WTO and, and is it just the reality that, you know, if you were building the decision making structure for the WTO today, you, you might not build it in the same way that it was built you know, when it was established. So is it, is, it, is, it, is it realistic to expect that incremental reform, given the, the way decisions are made at the, the, the WTO that everybody effectively has to agree to agree, is, is, that a, is it a realistic prospect when the, the, the national interests, either of individual countries or blocks of countries are so divergent? So I, I'm, I'm just curious whether it's a realistic expectation just for anybody, however well qualified they are, however you know, good they are to actually you know, create real reform in an organization like the WTO. Well, I, I mean, I can draw on my own experience in negotiating the uh, the trading rules on subsidies uh, many decades ago. Uh, different era, but uh, I think the experience shed some insights into the, co into the current negotiations. You don't need uh, the uh, overt uh, approval of 164 countries. That in, uh, what you need is the five or 10 major trading nations be cooperating and compromising with each other on an agreement. The others will then see, have to fall, fall in line or accept minor uh, uh, recalibrations of the deal uh, in deference to uh, concerns about the failure of the entire system, which protects most importantly, the poorest members. And that's, uh, I think something that we haven't tried to do because we've had such tensions between the major trading countries that we haven't tried to work together. But in the area of trade and environment, I think we will, uh, trade and climate change, I think we have a, a, a foundation for working with China, the European Union and other countries uh, to reestablish a, a, a new uh, solidarity on WTO reform. Terrific. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pick up the, the the issue that you raised, uh, because it's so in the news at, at the moment about uh, intellectual property, the, the uh, patent waiver, TRIPS uh, waiver that has been um, proposed uh, by the US government. I, I wonder, uh, Kellyanne, if you, if you might kind of unpack that a little bit for our audience. I mean, when, when we talk to when we talk to our members, uh, British American business, uh, particularly from the life science sector, yeah, that they're, they're, you know, they're, there's not a lot of support for this idea, um, both because of the precedent, but also because they don't believe it's actually focusing on the real, real problem. Um, you know, and it's a complex issue, like like all of these issues are. I, I wonder if you could. We, were you surprised? I suppose to start with that 
the US government, which has been such a strong supporter for internet intellectual property rights, um, made this proposal? Yeah, I, I yes, I, I was surprised that um, they uh, did go through with it. You know, I, as um, Jeff was talking about uh, Dr. Ngozi's prospects for success, I actually thought that she had been quite successful in crafting this idea of a third way on the TRIPS waiver, where for those who may not be following, India and South Africa had uh, proposed back in October that they waive uh, commitments under the TRIPS agreement um, for patents as well as trade secrets and um, other types of IP so that they could uh, manufacture vaccines. Um, whereas the United States, the EU, UK, Canada, Japan, South, Af or South uh, Korea, and other countries were strongly opposed to this idea. Um, Ngozi proposed what she called the third way, which was effectively to get both sides to the table and put pressure on industry as a way of um, saying, we could do this uh, unless you industry come up with a better idea. And the US was playing a similar negotiating strategy. Ambassador Catherine Tai had um, invited the CEOs of various pharmaceutical companies in to talk to them. I thought that pressure campaign was actually working. Um, now representing industry, there were a lot of way, a lot of talk and discussion about trying to come up with creative ways forward to get more vaccines to countries that need it. But the TRIPS waiver in and of itself won't result in more vaccines being available any faster. As uh, Jeff noted, there are a bunch of other restrictions to market, um, which really need to be addressed first and foremost. So to my mind, this was purely a political decision based on pressure from civil society. A number of Democrats on the Hill were supportive of this idea. I didn't think that they would go through with it. Um, now that we have, it's triggered this negotiation process at the World Trade Organization. Who knows how long that will last, but it certainly does put pressure on a number of other countries who are facing their own domestic pressure from civil society. Um, so I still think there is scope for industry to come up with a more creative solution. Um, I, I don't think that all hope is lost if you are one of those who are opposing the TRIPS waiver, um, but, but I do know that it came as a, a surprise and certainly an about face in the U.S. Yeah, Marianne or David, did you have anything to add on this IP issue and what you think might 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 the, re the result might be? Well, I think again, I do agree with Kellyanne's assessment that this came um, as a surprise not only for U.S. pharma industry but also for other partners around the world that weren't necessarily consulted in advance. And I think there is also a sense where. Um, you know, some in the United States see this as a political movement to actually get pharma industry to adopt voluntary measures. And again, in the end, maybe a waiver might not be needed. But I think it's also important to understand that a waiver, um, you know, would very much be only one component of a much broader holistic strategy to tackle the real concern, which is to ramp up production and distribution globally. Yes, uh, amen to that. So um, it, it, I guess another you know, major issue that this last extraordinary 15 months has made us all think about um, is this broad question of, which would effectively vaccines is the same about supply chain um nationalization or supply chain security or whatever you want to call it and you know in the title of this this um uh discussion we we one of my colleague very wittily uh, said from fish to chips um and we might come back to fish but let's focus on chips because you know the, there is i think everyone's aware that there is some real concern about the availability of um uh, the semiconductors huge concentration in a very dangerous part of the world in Taiwan. And naturally, um, countries are thinking about, you know, how do we make sure that we don't run out of this stuff? And not only that, but you know, no, no country, no, no major Western country probably can take the risk in, in, in a future pandemic of not having medical supplies, PPE, all that kind of stuff. So I just wonder what the, what the implications of all that is. I mean, it, when it when it comes to people who are thinking about trade policy and also setting the rules about trade policy it is is the are the rules going to need to kind of say look you know when it comes to certain categories of goods you're going to you know, people are going to have to look after themselves i don't know david did you have a, a, a point of view about that it's a very yeah, broad topic i know but <laughs> I, th I think that um 2020 might have been the year when uh politicians discovered 
the complexity of modern global supply chains. That's possibly a little bit late, uh, given that they've been building up for quite a number of years, but they suddenly discovered that in the heat of crisis, they didn't know where things came from. And they didn't know that, you know, in order to make a vaccine, ingredients would have to come from many different countries. They've suddenly discovered this. And what worries me, I guess, is that they've suddenly discovered it and they think, now that's with this complex, how can we do it all ourselves? When what we see, I mean, from my point of view, vaccines is a great global success story. Obviously, there's lots of criticism, lots of people saying, look, the distribution is not so good. You can accept all of that and still say that to have vaccinated, I think the numbers as of yesterday were 1.3 billion. To have given 1.3 billion vaccines, you know, a, a year and a half after a uh, after a after a, uh, a pandemic starts is actually pretty impressive. But politicians are not seeing it like that. They're seeing um, a number of things that they were already seeing, like um, lack of domestic manufacturing. Now they're learning about the complexities of global supply chains. And they're sort of putting this together in a haphazard way and saying, well, I can solve my domestic manufacturing because I've learned about this global supply chain. And if I bring it all back to my country, I've solved the problem. And that's really worrying uh, on, on several on several bases, worrying because, you know, that's not how, how the supply chains are working. Governments don't run these supply chains. Businesses do. It's also worrying because I think we're seeing subsidies coming back into fashion and you worry about where that discipline is going. Um, so I think that I think there's real sort of problems here and how we sort of almost we see this in the US. We see it in the EU, slightly less in the UK, but it's still here. How do we, as trade professionals, say to politicians, hang on a minute, you want, might want to be a little careful, and businesses are going to have to, to join in here and say, um, yeah, it's not quite as simple as we'll just bring all our global supply chains back to France to pick a country at random. And Jeff, just picking up on that point and, and the, the, the point you made about China, a lot of the discussion about kind of reshoring um, is, all, is also linked to this kind of China US or China and the West uh, decoupling and some of that's about you know concern about Chinese trade issues but some of it is more about is more moral isn't it it's more about whether you want to do business in in China given some of the concerns about um, Chinese human rights practices and so on so are you are you expecting that this this reshoring or uh, supply chain nationalization is, is real or is it more kind of just kind of talk it's it's certainly not just talk uh there there are two key issues uh there's supply chain resiliency uh which will lead to some redundancy of supply chains which will add costs uh but businesses will have to undertake that so we will be less efficient less just in time than we we were in the past uh because of the recent experiences. But the other side is supply chain security. And that is being affected not just by the US-China trade war, uh, by the export controls that are being imposed on dual use items, uh, which are only going to get tighter uh, as, as, as we move forward. They may become more focused, uh, but uh, they are going to be a continuing part of our uh, uh, commercial relationships. Uh, because uh, the U.S. practices are embedded now in, in new laws uh, that are supported by both parties. So uh, this is an area where we're going to have to somehow find a, a, a new balance of commercial interests, uh, human rights and, and, and other environmental interests uh, and security interests. And, uh, and, and this is the challenge that Secretary of State Tony Blinken has. He has to deal with areas where we have to cooperate, where we have to uh, compete more aggressively, and where we're going to be uh, strong adversaries uh, in, in addressing concerns about what's happening in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, for example. So uh, this is going to pose new challenges uh, for the business community and for their lawyers, uh, Kelly. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, you're going to have I'm... to find some, some innovative uh, uh, policy approaches. I'd love, uh, Kellyanne, I'd love your, your, your kind of uh, comment on that. Um, you know, during the, um, during the general election campaign, uh, Joe Biden was, was kind of outspoken about saying, saying that 
the previous administration have been soft on China. I mean, I know, listen, that's an election campaign, but um, it, 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 this seems like, as you said earlier, a completely bipartisan issue. Um, and I just wonder what effect you know, that might have more broadly on sort of the global trade uh, environment. And then we're going to switch subjects in, in a minute, and, and I'm going to come to Marianne about uh, uh, carbon border taxes. But uh, uh, Kellyanne, please. Sure. I, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I largely uh, agree with Jeff. You know, the, the interesting uh, switch that happened once um, COVID became a, a global pandemic is that instead of the administration being in the driver's seat, on China, Congress became in the driver's seat. And if you've noticed at the last few months of the Trump administration, it was Congress that was pushing forward for sanctions on uh, Hong Kong. It was Congress that was putting bills forward on forced labor. It was Congress that was really putting pressure on the administration. So while the administration kept up the rhetoric, and certainly I, I think you can make a very solid argument that the Trump administration was tougher on China than any previous administration had been, all of a sudden you had this dynamic where two branches of government were united for the same goal. So with the Biden administration, whether he wants to be tough on China or not, that's where the politics are going. And so you see this large package, um, Schumer has put together a, a China package for those who are following. Um, it's different pieces of legislation uh, being considered by different committees. So funding for the CHIPS Act, plus um, consideration of trade measures on China, foreign relation and diplomatic measures on China. Those are all percolating through the Senate right now and potentially will be voted on in May, but they're going to drive the administration even further to a more aggressive posture. So um, I, I think two things are happening. One, there is the China component, which involves values, morals, uh, military aspirations, all of those other things that are in the not in the economic sector. And then you have in the economic zone, um, the, the questions about do we need to bring home our manufacturing? Do we need to shorten our supply chains vis-a-vis -vis China? And they're related, but not exactly the same. But those two forces operating and rowing in the same direction are creating the current dynamic. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. I, I, it also occurs to me, and you know, I think about our members, large, large multinational corporations, that I, I think you just have to have an answer. If you're, if you're, if you're doing a lot of business in China, um, but on the one, on the one hand, you're you're engaged in kind of ESG discussions domestically in the U.S. and you're doing a lot of business in China. You've got to you've got to have a set of statements as, that that explains that and uh, that that uh, talks that through for kind of customers and employees who are getting uh, increasingly concerned. Um, let Let's switch gears. I mean, clearly, climate issues are. Um, yeah, on everybody's minds at the moment uh, for obvious reasons and also for because we're going to be uh, leading up to COP26 in a few months. Um, and, you know, it'd be helpful, uh, Marianne, if you could just talk about, you know, your expectations um, as to how this impacts trade flows. And, Particularly, I, I guess the EU is looking to take a lead on um, carbon border taxes. Um, yeah, understandably, they if they feel in the EU that they're taking a leading position on uh, on green on green energy production, they don't want to be dis their, their local manufacturers and businesses to be disadvantaged from imports that come from uh, less carbon sensitive environment. So what, what are the what are the prospects for this actually kind of happening in a kind of multilateral agreement uh, on on carbon border taxes? Well, let me first of all say again that this issue of trade and climate is a two way street that clay, trade obviously has implications for climate, but climate risks also have implications for the trade flows and again pose vulnerabilities for supply chains, for example. Um, so within that context, again, there is a lot of discussions right now for um, carbon border adjustment mechanisms. The EU is certainly in the lead on that and expected to um, put forward its proposal this summer. The key question is to what extent that is going to be compatible with WTO obligations. That would be quite um, something if it weren't, or if it was being then challenged at a WTO. And again, even though the EU, but also the UK and the US have a broad and shared interest in tackling climate change and again, related trade policies, 
This is actually also an area where I think there could be transatlantic friction down the road because again, the US um, has sent quite conflicting signals on that matter. And I think sees a carbon border adjustment mechanism as a measure of last resort. Whereas again, for the European Union in particular, it's, um, you know, it's the way around. Um, more broadly speaking, again, um, there is also the broader issues um, of sustainability, which are being tackled at a WTO. Um, again, fishery subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies, um, all of that is linked to a broader agenda of sustainability. And let me also link this issue of sustainability to the previous discussion that we've had just on supply chains, because I think um, semiconductors, critical um, raw materials, or earth in particular, are important for reaching the carbon um, climate term targets. And again, making that transition to the low carbon economy possible. And there is an opportunity here to also work with allies. Even though we talked quite a bit about kind of onshoring, there is an opportunity here to work with allies, um, in particular, again, um, South Korea, for example, Taiwan, but also for the transatlantic partners, there could be an opportunity here for shared stockpiles, for example. So just to put that on the table, that it's not just kind of national policies, but also an opportunity for transatlantic cooperation. David, I'm not sure. I'm 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 not sure I know. Where where's the UK on uh, 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 carbon border adjustments? I, I have they have they said anything? Has the UK government said anything, or is it is it one of those classic things where it's going to have to make a choice between the EU and US position? Um, I think we've said we're going to do something along these lines, and I think within the uh, uh, EU uh, TCA there is a talk of uh, possibly coordinating but equally I think I think it's one of those issues that the UK is still is, st is still thinking about uh, broadly hasn't fully hasn't fully decided uh, where, where we're going to go on it and actually I think the sensible thing to do on carbon border adjustment mechanism is actually at this stage to wait to see what the EU does because there are so many questions about whether you can design this in a way that is essentially fair um, allows for trade to still to, con to continue is in line with WTO rules. You know, the EU is doing something incredibly com trying to do something incredibly complex. Let's wait to see whether they what they actually come out with. We're expecting an EU proposal in about two months time on it. So we might see more then. And Kellyanne, have you got any perspective from a US um, uh, point of view on either the um, carbon border tax or, or any other kind of climate related issues that might impact uh, this tra these trade discussions? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly there is a lot of will on this side of the Atlantic to do something. I think the problem is nobody has come up with exactly what that is that they want to do. Um, but if you notice the administration has, I think six or seven different climate czars and different agencies in the administration. So I certainly anticipate action on this front, but uh, you know, there, I, you forget sometimes that they're only uh, two months and some change into the administration. So they, um, they are still working on developing a lot of their strategy. So we're in a wait and see mode. Jeff, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the immediate challenge is going to be the U.S. response to the European uh, uh, policy that comes out probably mid-July. And uh, it, as I understand it, the European approach is going to try to minimize areas of friction with the United States by starting incrementally uh, in a few products or sectors. Uh, so buying time for the U.S. and the Europeans to try to develop a common front, which will not be easy uh, because the Europeans have a, a carbon price through their uh, emissions trading system. The United States is going to have to or, or is seeking to try to find implicit prices for, for carbon, which is going to be very difficult when you look at how do you value regulations or lack of regulations. But uh, there is going to be immediate conflict when the European pro proposal comes out because it's going to hit China and India and Eastern European countries. Uh, and uh, they're going to challenge uh, the w in the WTO, uh, the European policy. And the Europeans are going to say, yes, uh, it, it's consistent. And the, uh, the others are going to say, no, it is inconsistent. And I suspect they're both right. And that's going to be, pose a problem, particularly in an area at a time when we don't have an operational uh, 
or, or at a time we have a disabled uh, appellate body uh, in the WTO? Well, so that's a that's a kind of a dispute that's that's kind of coming down the track. Uh, no, no doubt about that. But let, let's let's kind of go back to the disputes that we're we've got on the table with us today. I mean, we I think we talked, and I'll stay, Jeff, with you if I may. Just we talked a, a little bit earlier about this kind of sense that the EU and the US would like to get the kind of Airbus Boeing dispute off the table. Um, you know, some of the other. Um, the steel and aluminum tariffs and these other issues. What 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 do you what do you think the process, Jeff, is going to be for getting this done? I mean, do you, do you, are you optimistic that this timetable of getting something done by July um, is 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 realistic? Well, I think there's a strong interest uh, on both sides of the pond to uh, resolve the Boeing Airbus dispute. This has been going on for a long, long time. I, I mean, people val. Uh, number it in decades, but actually the roots of that problem uh, uh, began in the Tokyo round when we were developing the new subsidy rules and civil aircraft was exempted from those rules uh, to lay the foundation for, for the dispute that began in the 80s. Uh, I think uh, you can get a, a practical compromise. It's long overdue. Uh, and I think uh, politically, it serves the purpose uh, of the Biden administration to start building bridges again to Europe. Uh, and this is a, a, a very effective way to, to begin that process. So whether it happens in four months or whether that four month deadline is extended to six months, I don't think is, is, uh, is uh, a great problem, but uh, I suspect that it will be resolved before the G20 meeting this fall. Marianne, did you have a, a, a follow-up point of view on that? Well, again, I think there is interest on both sides um, to move those discussions forward and come to a permanent solution. Um, Liz Trust again, has very much reiterated um, that something is possible within that four months deadline. So by July, um, but again, I agree with Jeff, whether it's four months or six months is rather um, you know, not the key question. It is more, you know, can a permanent solution be reached? Because if not, the real issue is industrial subsidies by China increasing you. So if there is a shared transatlantic um, agenda, to you know, tackle those issues, then you really have to have a permanent solution in place. Just, I'm going to leave the last five minutes for each of you to say what we've missed in this discussion. But before we get to that, I'm going to, David, come to you just on on the disputes briefly. You know, the there's been some kind of shenanigans around fish um, in Jersey as a sort of result of sort of, I guess. In, in, implementation issues around the uh, TCA. Are, are these are these short term, or 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 does this have? Uh, can the, is this likely to escalate? You just wanted to talk about fish, didn't you? Yeah. Well, I needed um, to get it in somehow, didn't I? <laughs> so, uh, what I think you can expect to see in the UK-EU relationship is that there will be. I think an ongoing number of uh, individual small frictions. Lots of trade will continue, although we're already seeing a little bit of a drop down to a down to a new level. But the two sides really have to learn to to deal with each other. The the fish dispute was a classic of this. It really wasn't something major, but it quickly escalated into it, and equally as quickly is kind of deflating away to be uh, to be less important. So you know. And what, what have we missed in this discussion, uh, briefly, if you could uh, pick a couple of points or a point? Um, I, I guess that in, in looking at some of those big issues, you've not talked, you know, we've not talked about um, some of the regional integration that is still proceeding. Uh, we're not talking about Africa and the AFC FTA, and we're not really talking about RCEP. Um, so, you know, what, what, I, I guess, and we're not talking about, in a way, you've got so much, such a huge a trade agenda at the moment, such a huge trade policy agenda. We, sp we spend a lot of time talking about trade policy. We perhaps spend not quite enough time talking about actual trade that is going on and good things that are, that are still happening. There is a frightening agenda at the WTO, much of which will not happen, and yet trade will carry on regardless of not much of, of 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 what is happening there so i think there is a disconnect there that we need to to be thinking about as well 
Well said. I always say that. I mean, we, we, we support a FTA between the US and the UK, but actually trade and investment between the UK and the US is pretty good. So improvements would be would be marginal. Marianne, what have we missed? What, have, what, what should we have talked about that we haven't? Well, we've touched upon it, but I think we could have spent a lot more time on the move towards plurilateral negotiations within the W2 umbrella. So again, because consensus among 164 members now is really impossible, we are seeing move towards um, plurilateral agreements. So again, groups of WTO members um, come together on specific sectors and it Again, the case in point here is the e-commerce negotiations, which again are very, very critical. And um, I see, you know, movements by the US, um, by the EU and the UK to move that forward, um, quite important. But it's also important to keep in mind who's not at the table in those discussions. India comes to mind here. And how do you engage with those countries that choose, again, not to be part of those discussions is going to be quite critical as we are seeing the rise of digital trade become much, much more prominent. Absolutely. And, and I think the, the kind of legal risk about data flows is probably one of the highest priority issues when we talk to our members um, when they're thinking about um, trade between the US and the UK uh, and the EU, of course. Uh, Jeff, what, what have we missed? Well, uh, I think uh, the two central things that have just been uh, touched on peripherally. Uh, one is uh, UK participation in the uh, CPTPP. Uh, David mentioned it at the beginning. I, I think it's very important uh, for British industry uh, to be in the Asia Pacific uh, supply chains, uh, to be fully integrated in that. And it's a very comprehensive agreement covering goods and services and investment. It's the US template uh, basically that uh, is in the USMCA uh, uh, that the US adopted in many of the reforms of the USMCA. So it would be a, a, a good deal. And I think uh, the fact that the UK is starting negotiations now is going to lead other countries like Korea to, to try to join in as well. So it could make it for a much more uh, important uh, trade agreement and, and, and much bigger uh, economic footprint. Uh, that will benefit the businesses that are participating from the member countries. So I, I think that's a critical point. Uh, there's the other big point of the uh, advance of industrial policy and the use of subsidies. That would that that has to be another program for you. Yeah. Well, we're running a we're running a briefing with the DIT Department for International Trade. Uh, I think next week on on the uh, CPTPP hearing from the negotiating team there. So anybody interested in that, just uh, just get in touch. And we started with you, Kelly, and I'm going to finish with you as well. What 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 have we missed in this discussion? Well, I, I think we covered quite a bit of ground, but a, a couple of uh, points I'll offer just at the end. You know, I think on the from the U.S. side, in terms of trade agreements, to the extent that we see any in the next couple of years, I think they're going to be more of these sectoral agreements, like digital trade agreements or single chapter agreements with uh, various countries and trading partners. I do think that we will see more of that and potentially with the U.K. as well. Um, on the WTO, I'm a lot more pessimistic. Um, you know, the fish subsidy negotiations have been ongoing for 20 years. E-commerce has been going on for a couple of years, but the only sort of uh, 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 harvestable fruit has been provisions on spam and e-signatures. I, I just don't see those negotiations going anywhere. I think this is really a, a break it or make it moment. And it will either be one where Dr. Ngozi, who I have a great deal of respect for, she was just handed a lemon, um, is able to really come up with a very ambitious agenda and a time limited one in which countries meaningfully participate or the WTO will potentially fail to exist in 10 years. I, I really think that's the moment we're at. So um, for me, it, it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens in Geneva, if anything. And then finally, um, I, I wanted to get in on the aircraft action because I actually was one of the litigators of those cases 10 years ago. Um, I'm even more ambitious about a settlement. Um, if I were taking bets, I'd say that we'll actually see an announcement by the G7 in wow. June. Fantastic. Well, listen, I'm just going to say thank you to uh, uh, our brilliant uh, panelists for covering so much ground so quickly. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. And I'm, I'm going to pass back now to Anthony Baldwin, CEO of AIG, for the final word. 
Look, um, firstly, a big thank you uh, to you, Duncan, and to Bab for organizing what had really been an incredible session. Um, you, you did set yourself a challenge about covering uh, a significant amount of ground that I think uh, you and, and our excellent speakers did a, a terrific job in, in doing that. I mean, look, I'll leave it, I'll leave it with, with this. Um, you know, AIG as a multinational is deeply interested in furthering and progressing uh, discussions and, and the narrative on international trade, um, whether the glass is, uh, as one of our panelists said, is, is half full or half empty, that will be, uh, you know, very much dependent on the topic and your perspective. But from my uh, point of view, um, a big thank you uh, to all of you and a big thank you to everyone that joined and look very much forward to supporting uh, this series and uh, BAB in the future. Thank you very much, Duncan. Well, thank you, Anthony, and thanks again to everybody our speakers, our supporters at AIG, and all of you for watching. And if you'd like to see it again, it'll be up on the website in a day or two. See you soon.